Sunday feels like church to me. <laughs> First thing, all mobiles off. The world will end, or your world will end, if the phone rings while this is going on. Okay? Tiny little bit of news before we jump into this big piece of gorgeousness is that from one o'clock today, there are tickets available for the great hall performance of Roberts, his reading this evening will be available up at the Dartington Estate at the box office and they are, for us they're only £10. Okay, that's extraordinary. So, here we are, we survived the weather, we survived the brief splashes of sunlight, we're getting knocked about by poetry, we're getting assaulted by story and it feels pretty good to me. So what we have here today is something that hasn't happened here for a long time. And I'm really proud and honoured and to look out at all your gorgeous faces to introduce the man, Robert Bly. Danny yeah, yeah, yeah. Danny. Well, we're going to do a story this morning, but... Uh, we should begin with the poem, don't you think so? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, how about Pablo Neruda? Yes. Yes. yes! He was a phenomenon. No one knows how this happened. In this shitty century, along comes Pablo Neruda. <laughs> and, um... <laughs> give us the poem about driving to California. I'm not Pablo. Jay. I know, but you want it? Yeah, Jay, give us a poem about driving to California. That's Pablo Leeming. <laughs> driving to California. All right, this is a little poem called uh, I Pick Up a Hitchhiker. Oh, yes. <laughs> After a few miles, he tells me that my car has no engine. I pull over, and we both get out and look under the hood. He's right. <laughs> we don't say anything more about it all the way to California. <laughs> and that's Jay Leeming, and you should buy his book. Yeah. <laughs> Great book of poems. What book have you got here, Jay? Uh, it's a book called Dynamite on a China Plate. Yeah, yeah. First book of poems. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Book. So they come in skinny forms, too. <laughs> <laughs> they also come in fat forms, like Pablo Neruda. So let's begin with the Pablo Neruda poem, if it's okay with you. Yeah. 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 And we know that uh, it's a wonderful thing to be a human being. Hmm? <laughs> he has another <laughs> opinion. <laughs> it's why so I'm sick of being a human being. Now that's where we're beginning. <laughs> So happens I'm sick of being a human being. So happens that I walk into tailor shops and movie houses dried up, waterproof, like a swan made of felt, 
steering my way in the water of wombs and ashes. The smell of barber shops makes me want to break in out into horse sobs. Mm, amen. The only thing I want is to lie still, like stones or wool. The only thing I want is to see no more stores, no gardens, no more goods, no spectacles, no elevators. Well, so happens I'm sick of my feet. <laughs> my toenails and my hair and my shadow. So happens I'm sick of being a human being. Nevertheless, it'd be marvelous to kill a nun, to kill a law clerk with a cut lily. <laughs> it'd be great to kill a nun with a blow in the ear. <laughs> you know, I was talking about some of the joys of being a human being. <laughs> it'd be great to kill a nun with a blow in the ear. It'd be great to go through the streets with a green knife letting out yells until I died of the frost. <laughs> I don't want to go on being a root in the dark, insecure, stretched out, shivering in sleep, going on down into the moist guts of the earth, taking in and thinking, eating every day. Isn't that right? <coughs> disgusting after eating. You like eating. Disgusting. <laughs> I don't want so much misery. I don't want to go on as a root in a tomb, alone under the ground, a warehouse with corpses, half frozen, dying of grief. <coughs> and so Neruda says, you know, in order to be uh, alive or something, you have to feel all this. Mm -hmm. That's why Monday, when it sees me coming with my convict face, blazes up like gasoline. And it howls on its way like a wounded wheel. And it leaves tracks full of warm blood leading toward the night. And it pushes me into certain corners, into certain moist houses, into hospitals where the bones fly out the window, into shoe shops that smell like vinegar, and certain streets that are as hideous as cracks in the skin. There are sulfur-colored birds and hideous intestines hanging over the doors of houses that I hate. I like this. And there are false teeth forgotten in the coffee pot. <laughs> I love this. And there are mirrors that ought to have wept from shame and terror. <laughs> and there are umbrellas everywhere and venoms and umbilical cords. But I stroll along serenely with my eyes, with my shoes, with my rage, forgetting everything. I walk by going through office buildings and orthopedic shops and courtyards with washing hanging from the line, underwear, towels, and shirts, from which slow, dirty tears are falling. So that's pretty good for the one poem of the 20th century, isn't it? The amount of pain and suffering in it. All right, what are we doing here today? What's going on? You're going to tell a story, Robert. I am. <laughs> <laughs> that was the latest report, anyway. Mm. Should we begin with a little drum? Mm -hmm. sort of throw the stories about. Okay, the first thing is, we've got to get the story in the room. The story's full of medicine. Every single one of us here today has someone else that should be here. The 
would benefit from hearing this story. And because it's Sunday, I like to pray. And a story can be a prayer. So as I call the story into the room and I'm going to sing for a moment, picture in your heart someone to send the juice of this story out to. Someone sick, someone lost, someone happy, someone sad. And in some beautiful way, this gorgeous tent right now gets that bit bigger. Once upon a time, when the world was as wild as the talons of a hawk, as fresh as the backside of a little baby, and it's not in the story, no, I'm going up, you're mean to me, and as beautiful as the sun rising, there was a great forest, and in the middle of that forest was a castle, and to the north, the south, the east and the west, the forest extended. In the middle of the castle was a great king. And if I'm going to tell you about the king, I should tell you that he had three daughters. Three daughters. I've got one, I know what that's like. <laughs> now the inside of the castle, the grounds of the castle, had a beautiful peacock sculpted into the hedges. It was gorgeous. It was just so. It was perfect. It was elegantly trimmed. It was... It was very lovely. The English know all about nice. It was very nice. And the first two daughters, those oldest daughters, they loved it as it was. But there was a third daughter. A daughter that at night would gaze from the turrets at the sun going down. A daughter that would secretly read Rumi in her room at night and understand it all in a single flash. It's not in the story. <laughs> and one day, one day, one day, one day, one day, she went out into the woods. <coughs> she went out into the forest. And she saw a white bear lying on its back, playing with the reed with all its four feet. So, she said, you know, uh, I'd love to have that read. <laughs> and the bear said, well, but you'll have to pay with yourself, you know. You can't do it with gold or silver or anything, you'll have to pay with yourself. So, she agreed to do that. Is that right? Yep. What happened next? He goes what? back. He says, I'll come for you in three days. I'll come for you in three days. So she goes back to her father, the king, and she is full of excitement. Because I've got to tell you, when she saw that golden wreath, everything in her life up until that point became grey and foggy. And she'd negotiated everything to get that wreath. You know, when you saw a wreath like that, nothing like anything you'd ever seen before. So she goes back to her father, the king, the king, for his part, does not scold her, not angry. He just says, uh-huh. Uh <laughs> so he calls his alchemists and his goldsmiths and everybody, and they start to create. Yeah, I said, you don't have to right? go to all this trouble, you know, to marry a bear. I mean, that's right. <laughs> well, there's a couple of goldsmiths, so they say, he says to them, make this wreath. And so they ask her how big it was, but this big. So they work two or three weeks and they get the thing done and they show it to her and what did she say? Ah, ha, 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 the leaves were just curlier. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they landed just so on my head. This is too tight. So the king says, oh Christ. <laughs> it's like to have a daughter. So they make another one, right? They do. It takes they another do. couple weeks. What happened, Danny? It, 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 the, the leaves were wrong again. And it had acorns instead of um, oak leaves. Oak leaves. Yes. Yeah. Stay with us. <laughs>
wrong. It was wrong. It was wrong. She rejected it. So they have to go and do it again. Hmm? Mm-hmm. They do it the third time. How did it turn out the third time? Well, the third time, it was getting more and more elaborate. It was getting more ornate every time. But still, in her secret heart, she couldn't remember. She couldn't get go, let go of the smell of the wild wood and that deep promise. When there's a big opening of the soul, many things will come and try and stop you from going down it. But the deal with the bear had been struck, had it not? It did. Now, what was the tradition <coughs> in Norway of that time about who married first? Well, <coughs> the um. The oldest daughter marries first. Ah. You understand how that is. So, the bear came and uh, the king arranged for the oldest daughter to go. Well, bears are kind of nearsighted. And, uh, <laughs> so, the, the bear says, All right, get up on my back then and we'll go. So, he takes her along and, and, he's wearing, and he says to her, now, What is it like riding on my back? Is that right? Yes. Mm-hmm. And what did she say? He say? This is, as they went along, he said, have you ever sat more softly than you're sitting now? <laughs> and she said, well, on my father's lap, you know, I sat more softly yeah. than I'm sitting now. And he said, oh, shit, it's the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> and he threw her off. And she had to walk back, and when she got all back, she was covered with thorns and needles and she looked like hell. <laughs> so the next day the bear comes, I want my way to do it. So the father sends his second daughter. Do you know this scene? Second daughter gets out. They go a while, what happens? Well, same ritual question. Have you ever sat more comfortably than you do now? He said, yes I have. On my father's lap at court so many times before. And he said, it's the wrong one. Same scene. Dropped off at the gate. And each time he comes to the gate, more and more people are trying to stop him from getting in. Do you remember? All the professional haircutters in Norway had turned up. There were various priests. There were zoos and cages and everything to stop the white bear getting in. So the bear simply uh, knocks all that away. I mean, dealing with the white bear is is very different than an election or something. That's right. So he knocks them all down, and he goes in, and he takes her in that bed, puts her on his back, and they go. And he asks her the question, Question. have you ever sat more softly than you sit now? She says, never. And then he asks her, have you ever seen more clearly than you see now? Never. I said it's the right one. Ah. That's the right one. So then what happens? He takes her to his place. <laughs> to show her his etchings. <laughs> now there was something unexpected in this. Because she thought she may well, by following the reef, may be heading to a cave full of bones and moss. But they travelled, it seemed, nine times around the world. But when they got there, they found a castle more ornate and more beautiful than anything her father had ever come up with. In fact, this white bear was a lord whose name, his name was Valamon. Valamon, the white bear king. He was the white bear king. So they lived there. And in the daytime he was a bear and he went out and he did the things that bears do. <laughs> and at night he would come home and they would go into the bedroom and they had to put out all the lights. That was the deal. Darkness, complete darkness. And in the complete darkness he would turn into a man. And she enjoyed that. <laughs> and she loved to run her hands over his shoulders and over his chest and all of that. She said, oh, beautiful. This is just exactly right. Beautiful. But what was the problem in the morning? When he woke up, he turned into a white bear. God. She never saw him as Many a women have experienced this. <laughs> He was on something else. He was something else. 
now. <laughs> now, something extraordinary happened in these uh, midnight rendezvous. Three times, the wild third daughter got pregnant. Three times she had ba babies, and three times the babies were quietly ushered away. Yeah, three times the baby disappeared. But so many weird things had already happened. <laughs> so that's the way that went. Yeah, that was the way that went. But somehow, after a while, she began to reflect on the violence of how she'd left her mum and dad. And in some peculiar way, she missed them. And so she said, Balamon, right pulse of my whole understanding, sky man of the dawn, radiant flower, could I possibly go back and see him? For a visit. For a visit. What could be the harm? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Should she go? Yes! Yes! So, she goes. <laughs> and uh, she has all her wonderful things that she's been given. Her, her gowns and her jewels. And uh, she comes in to her home, and her mother and father greet her, and her sisters are kind of astonished <laughs> with the things she's been given. <laughs> her dresses are much prettier than ours. So they took her aside. They said, tell us about this bear. What's going on? He says, well, at night. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me tell you, <laughs> in the darkness, but what, you've never seen him. He could be hideous. He could be covered with boils. He could be a monster. They suggested that she take a candle. Yeah, it was her mother that suggested the candle. Yeah, the mother came in and got in on it. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think of this idea. Take the candle and lift it up in the middle of the night and then you'll be able to see. What do you think? Just wait till he's asleep. Mm. He won't know. I have to tell you that this candle was one of those kind of thick, waxy, yellow church-like candles. There was only a stub of it left. I think she'd been lifting it up to her husband's place for many years. <laughs> That's pretty good off the cuff. That's good, yeah. <laughs> And the father, for his part, the king, quietly reading the Norwegian Times in the corner, <laughs> ruffled the paper and said, what did he say? I don't think it's a good idea. That's right, that's what he said. And what did the wife say? Shut up! <laughs> she uttered the immortal phrase again, what would be the harm? What would be the harm? So with that, she made her farewell, she offered her libations, she headed back nine times throughout the world, through the deep forest, until finally she was back in Balamon's arms. And it was a sweet thing to witness. And the sun and the moon did a little boogie in the sky at the meeting of these two star-crossed star lovers. The day and after they'd had some lovemaking and, uh, and he had fallen asleep, she took out the candle, didn't she? And she lit it. And she held it up like this. Oh, he was beautiful. The shoulders were gorgeous. The chest was wonderful. The legs tremendous. Even the stomach was good and flat and wonderful. But what happened? A little drop of, of the candle wax fell on his shoulder and he woke up. Wow! Why did you do this? Ah! Could we all make the noise of Valamon at that moment, please? <laughs> Remember the last time someone lifted a candle to your face? <laughs> and he said, One more day! 
more day and I would have been a man. Oh, the tide. One more day. But now it's over. And he turned you into a bear. And he rushed out. He yeah. rushed out of the room and she grabbed a hold of his ass. The hair of his ass. And she clung on there. She clung on there. And he dragged her for miles. No, keep going. He dragged her for miles. How far? Through the woods. And her dress was all torn up. Her nightgown was all torn. And she was cut with stones. And, and then she couldn't hang on anymore. And she was left there in the wilderness. No. And they say small birds grew in her hair. <laughs> and bits of ivy wrapped itself around her legs. And she was alone. And all she could see in the distance was that tiny white speck of Valamon with all her love and all her hope attached disappearing into the night. So that's a great was. And you know the story is trying to say we've all done that. Sometimes right after high school or something had happened. So what happens then? Well she wanders looking for the bear. She asked people, hmm? have you heard of the white bear king Valamon? Hmm? And they said, Who? No. And she wandered. The old stories say she wandered on the place where there were no paths left. And great thorns wedged themselves into her arms and her shoulders and she slept underneath hedges and under a cold frosty night sky. And you know what the stories say, it took at least four days and four nights. And when stories say it took four days and four nights, it means a very, very, very then, one day, she saw up ahead smoke coming from a chimney. And a yellow light in the window. It was a cottage, wasn't it? Yep. She went and knocked on the door. And there was a lovely woman there. And there was a small baby. I mean, it was a young child. A young child. Yeah, that's right. So what did she do? Well... Not only was there the old, the young child, there was an old crone, one of those gorgeous women with great hook noses and bright blue piercing eyes and a silver plait that went right down her back. And she opened the door and peered in. And she said, excuse me, I've been out and lost in the forest for so long. I've been lost in the forest for so long. It would be a sweet and wonderful thing if I could just come in for a moment. And as they came in, she, didn't she talk to the daughter? She got down on the floor with the little girl while the old woman was cooking. And she played games and told stories. And she asked them things like, you know, do you ever have a little uh, doll? Do you have any little doll? Well, I got this one sort of little doll. So they said, shall we make some clothes for her? And they took some old shirts and stuff. And, and together they made little clothes for the doll and a little the covering for the head. And, and this took quite a while, many hours, but the child was delighted. It's important to do that, you know. Pay attention to the children in the room. What it is they would like? After a while, they noticed that this young child had a pair of golden scissors. And every time it snipped in the air, something very magical would happen. Clothes would pour out from the end. Leather jerkins with the designs of unicorns in them. Beautiful woolen socks. Beige. Nothing beige ever came out of those scissors. There was a man on beige. No stonewashed jeans ever came out of them. And certainly no fecking trainers. So there was some gorgeous magical thing. And the daughter looked at the threadbare appearance of their guest and said, Oh, grandmother. Now, don't you think we could let her have this scissors? What do you think? Yeah, certainly give her the scissors. Is that yeah, right? that's exactly yeah, what that's right. exactly right. So she left with the scissors. And she walked and walked and walked and walked and walked. And then she came to another house in which there was a woman and there was a child. And she stopped there, did she? She did. And she went through this sort of thing again, playing with them. What else did she do? Oh, the little girl had some jacks. 
set of jacks, the bouncing ball mm. and the jacks, and they played jacks for hours. And they told secrets to each other. And the little girl warmed her heart. Mm. And she produced a goblet. She produced a goblet, and in that goblet, any kind of gorgeous thing could emerge. It could be a goblet full of hot chocolate. Could be a goblet full of water for the more boring amongst us. If you live at my house, it could be a goblet of great West Country ale. In my house, it would be tequila. Yeah. <laughs> what would be Robert's house? Oh, it would be wonderful Norwegian beer. <laughs> and you could pour endless amounts of whatever you wanted mm. out of the goblet. Mm. So that there was never any end to the drink, no. a variety of drinks. Yeah. And so, of course, seeing the parched appearance of the third daughter, he said, Oh, grandmother, could we not pass this on to nourish our guests and show some hospitality? And the crone said, For my part, I don't have a problem with this. <laughs> and so they gave it to her. And on she went back into the forest, but her pace quickening. And there is something that we should say at this point. Every cottage she went to, she asked, have you seen Balamon? Have you seen him? Have you seen him? Have you seen him? Have you seen the white bear? And they'd say, oh, I, I, a white bear came back here about three weeks ago. And he was heading for the mountain. Mm -hmm. Mountain? What mountain? Ah, oh, that mountain. He's heading for the big mountain, you know. Mm -hmm. Whoa. Here's so on the third time, what happened when she went to the third one? Well, when she went to the third one, she talks to the daughter, same scene, pays attention to small and subtle things, the heart's open. The daughter, the third daughter, has a cloth, and every time she opens that cloth, beautiful salads pour out, chicken and green and black chocolate, and anything that you could possibly desire and love, lived in there. Of course, they're seeing how skinny she is, they're seeing how impoverished, but they see she's now got some natty threads on. They now see that it looks like she's been drinking a lot of uh, blackberry juice and a good Shiraz. But she says, Mother, well, grant, not her mother, but sweet crone of the cottage, could she take this food and the cloth on it? And she said, Certainly she can. Have you seen Balamon? And they said, Well, oh, Balamon, you're, you're looking for Balamon. He came by here, you know, just yesterday. And he was heading up the hill. Now, what's, heading he gonna, up the what's he going to do up the hill? I don't know what she's going to do up here. <laughs> this is an important part of the story. <laughs> Are we now getting the sense that he's been under some sort of enchantment? There half the time. How do you think he got there? Was it an accident? No, no of course it wasn't an accident. There was a great, many tusked, udder ridden cousin of Baba Yaga. <laughs> of troll descent that lived at the top of that glass mountain and she fancied a little slice of Valamon for her own and in fact now these things had happened Valamon was rushing to the wedding he was going to have with the great Morrigan many-faced spectred hag on the top of the hill he was going to marry her can you imagine that her can you imagine one of your children going up to marry her <laughs> they say, they say her breasts lactated deadly nightshade. Yeah. Shoot on that! <laughs> and she had a pine tree growing out of her nose. Yes, <laughs> With dead men hanging off it. That's right. And they said whenever a bird flew by, she'd grab it needed like that. Right out of here. Boom! But we haven't got to her yet. The three daughter has now. Does she have the scissors? Yes. Does she have the goblet? Yes. Does she have the cloth? Yes. She has all of these things. And finally, there was another cottage at the bottom of the glass mountain. This time, no crone, but a family and a mother. And they were starving hungry, weren't they? A bunch of filthy children. A bunch of filthy children. With raggy clothes. The mother was making stone soup. Mm. <laughs> yeah. She boiled the stones quite a while and she said actually the children really felt it was nourishing. <laughs> Just, uh, watching it boil was a big help. Yeah. And she said that we pretend to the children 
that these pebbles are apples. Isn't that sad? And they, they offered to bring her in and share yeah. the soup with her. She says, well, I have a few things to add. <laughs> Spread out the glove on the table. Mm -hmm. She poured out the drinks and these children suddenly had hot chocolate. This is like a scene out of C.S. Lewis. Uh, there was hot chocolate and there was ham and eggs and chicken and there was toast and marmalade and, and every bats. gorgeous thing. They had bats! They had bats! <laughs> bats. Danny, Danny, you need to understand in this country bats has several meanings. <laughs> That's several meanings. They had glasses of milk in other words. So now everybody's fed. This woman has gone from a process of receiving to a process of giving. And that gorgeous. You know our television sets are so full of pebbles disguised as apples, and I'm amazed the sets don't break. So something beautiful had come into their midst. But she said, how am I going to get up the mountain? And the woman said, I can help you. My husband is a blacksmith. Now in the old stories, a blacksmith rubs up against the magician, up against the shaman, the ones that inspect the underside of the universe. <coughs> they can do great things. What yeah, do you the make? blacksmith is an old, old thing. Whenever you're near a blacksmith, you're near something good. And if you're going up a mountain, you need them. So what did the blacksmith do? He made, he made some little claws, is that right? Yes, he claws did. Claws for her feet and her hands. Mm -hmm. He came home, he saw that all his children had new clothes. They'd been well fed, and he was moved by the generosity of the girl, and so he went straight to work. And he made claws, iron claws, for her hands and her feet. And it's a glass mountain, you know? It's like getting a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> all around the base, all around the base of the glass mountain is this weight, and it's not snow, it's bones of all the people that tried to climb the glass mountain and failed, because it's an impossible thing to do. Yeah, they all, they all were writing poems, you know, on the way up, but, but the PhD system got them and they're all lying in the bottom. <laughs> That's right. That's not in the story. <laughs> It's in the one I read. Yeah, 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 yeah. So she climbs, she climbs, she climbs, and the rain comes down on her like bullets from a gun. But she doesn't look left, she doesn't look right, she just keeps going up into the clouds. Can you feel how cold her hands were? Can you feel how her clothes were sodden? But the memory of Valamon kept her going. And all that juice she had accumulated in the forest kept her going further and further up into the mountain until finally she heard the sounds of industry. She heard the sounds of things being created. She could see workmen. She knew that some wedding was indeed happening on the top of the mountain. And I've got to tell you, the second, the second that she got up there, the moment that that sweetness of her entered the top of the hag's kingdom, the hag was there. You can imagine what this looked like. I mean, the teeth came well down over the jaw, and the eyes, there were three or four eyes, and all of them were greedy, and uh, stuffing stuff in her mouth constantly. And bad news, hmm? Bad news. And she was like putting, she had a big feast, didn't she? She did. Tell us about the feast. Well, the feast. Her daughter laid all this gorgeous food out to her and she said, I hear there's a wedding, great troll queen. Here's an interesting detail. Why didn't the troll queen gobble her up immediately? There is some <coughs> etiquette that exists between deities and the right kind of questions. <laughs> she could have just gone, no, no. She didn't. She didn't. What's all this? And she said, well, I hear there's going to be a wedding. But you see, it's important if you get up there mm -hmm. near her that you have some food prepared. Ah, mm -hmm. yes. Now, could she have got the food without being in the forest? I don't think so. No. And I don't know what it means, this food, but there's something that you need to produce out of your own life. Mm -hmm. And it could be poems, or it could be novels, or it could be something, and it could be dances, some kind of thing that you prepared. Because you can't do it with the ugly ah one. 
by yourself. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's one reason you come to a place like this, to try to learn how to do those things and go home and do them. Mm -hmm. They may save your children. I'm getting off the subject. Yeah. That's <laughs> So, she said, what are you going to have for the guests? Because I've heard there are people coming from Prague, New York, Italy, Germany, all over, and they like food in Italy, I can assure you of that. What are you preparing? And she said, bones, 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 bones. <laughs> Just bones? Yes. And she said, in your opulence and your fullness and your great majesty and your deep mystery, would you not want to present something more than bones? What about all the food here? And she said, I, 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 what are your terms? What are your terms so I can have this food? What were the terms? One night, alone, with a white bear king. One night? <laughs> oh, honey, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> All right, here's your audio fucking food. <laughs> and there was really good food laid out there. Was nice <laughs> so then, um, one night with the Bear King. Mm. Yeah. The Hat Queen said, this is not a great problem for me. Be at his chambers at six o'clock sharp. And so, at six o'clock, she gathered. But didn't the Troll Queen push past her and said, I want a secret word with Valamon just before you go in. So she did go in, and there was Valamon. And she said, how are you doing, honey? <laughs> <laughs> I got a little drink for you, honey. Just to keep your strength up, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so he drank it, didn't he? He did. He down he went, she said, there are special things in this drink to keep your strength up for the wedding night because, my God, you're going to need it. <laughs> so then she came and said to her, All right, we're ready. The Valamon is in there. Good luck. So she goes in. Valamon's asleep. Is that right? Yeah, fast asleep. She pinches him. Nothing. Wake up, wake up. It's taking me so long to get here. Come on. What happens? Well, her tears came down and they came, came down so copiously, it is said, that all the lakes of North America and Minnesota, the place of the 10,000 lakes, are filled with the tears from the wild third daughter that night. It's not in the story. No. <laughs> <laughs> the way I read it, it was. Exactly. Thank you, darling. <laughs> He's the king of it's not in the story. And so she cried and she cried and she wept in her lamentation. Went all night long, all night long. But Valamon did not wait. No. And so the dawn came, and she was ushered from it. She went back to her, uh, back to her original position. And this time, this time, she brought out the goblet. And in a second, of course, the great, many tusked hag queen appeared, saliva dripping off the edge of the tusks and causing acid to fall on the ground and great sizzles here and there, <laughs> crows and ravens moving slowly round her shoulders, the heads of half-dead men looking hopefully at us for some hope of reprieve, but it was too late. And she said, you had a good night, did you, honey? <laughs> Enjoy yourself, honey? <laughs> you look a little tired. <laughs> she said, I got a What's in the drink? And she said, well, what are you planning to have for the wedding? What were they going to drink at the wedding? Blood. <laughs> blood. Oh, blood, that's good. <laughs> blood. Blood, 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 blood. <laughs> They're all my pretty boys and girls. Blood. And she said, well, in this blood, in this magical goblet, which I believe is in some way related to a sort of grail-like thing, mm -hmm. anything can appear in it. We could get the clearest <coughs> lagers from Germany. We could get the most wonderful wines. We could get anything you want, and you would grow in prestige amongst the world if surely you showed a little bit of largesse to your guests. <laughs> and you had a variety. You said, what are your terms? What are your terms? One night. One night. One night with Valamon. Oh, you drive a hard bargain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you got it. <coughs> Six o'clock rolls around. Just as she's about to go in, the troll queen pushed past her, didn't she, and went into the chamber with her little drink. Yeah. Just a nightcap. 
a little something for you. So drink it down, honey, you'll need it. So does he drink it? Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry, but we all drank it twice. Mm. <laughs> That's right. So he drinks it. And then what happens? She comes in, falls asleep. She's weeping all night, but this time there was a carpenter. Oh, that's so great. This part of the story is so great. So she wept all night. And that's important somehow. Weeping all night. You don't say it's one of those things. Uh, you don't say my parents went through the same thing, so it'll be all right. No, at this point in the story, the, it's right to weep. Well, it happened that there were some carpenters, wasn't mm -hmm. it, next door? In the yeah. next room. In the next room, there were some carpenters, and they heard this woman weeping. For two nights. What did they do? Well, when she was ushered out in the morning, they knocked on the door and Valamon woke from his deep and dreamless sleep. And they said, who is, who is the woman that appears at night and weeps all the time? And in a flash, Valamon knew, didn't he? Whoa. What woman? And suddenly he understood. So, a woman has been in my room weeping for two nights in a row. Ah, well, out she went again, really distraught, but finally with her cloth with all the food on it. In an instant, the, tra the hag queen is there. She's looking at the food. It's the scissors. The scissors? Are we at the scissors? Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> yes, this is important. She says, what are you going to wear as your bridal arrange? She says, sackcloth. <laughs> Ashes. Ashes. Sackcloth. Ashes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else is she going to wear? Skin. I like slug skins. Slug skins. Skulls. 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 What? Skulls. <laughs> but the wild third daughter gets to work and she says, I heard people are coming from New York. I heard Vogue is planning to cover it. Now I have a pair of scissors here that can produce any kind of clothes you could possibly want. How would it be if you had a black leather wedding dress with red lightning going down the side <laughs> and horrible dark existential poetry sewn into it. <laughs> Let's skip the wedding. <laughs> so for one last night. She says, what are your terms? What are your terms? And again, what is it, Robert? What? One night. One night. Alone. Alone. Well now, something has happened in the meantime. Because mm -hmm. um, how did he know that this was the last night? And uh, when she came to offer him the little nightcap, oh, he said, thank you. You're such a good hostess. <laughs> and But isn't that a bird over there? <laughs> and they looked and he put it on his shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's important. <laughs> you need to have a shirt sometimes. <laughs> Naked, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but as the hag queen got to the door, what? did it feel right? She looked back and she said, I wonder if he's really asleep. I don't know, this little son of a bitch. <laughs> she pulled a great needle out of her hair. Nerdy needle. And what did she do? Needle. She found this here. Uh, yeah, she just stuck right it right through, through the muscle, all the way all through. The way. And he didn't move one muscle. Even his face didn't change. And she says, "Well, I guess the little fucker's asleep." <laughs> so she left the chamber, and immediately in came the daughter. The moment the Hag Queen was out, his eyes shot awake, what? finally. What the moment the Hag Queen was gone, the daughter came in, he woke up, and great sweetness filled the room. Great catching up, tears fell like rain, and they got to talking, and they got to thinking how on earth they could get out of this mess. 
And as they did so, they made such a racket that those carpenters who were next door, those carpenters who were next door, came in and said, how can we help? How can we help? You see, because tomorrow is the day when the wedding is going to take place. Of the man and... Ah! The wedding is planned for tomorrow morning. Hmm, so even though the lovers have found each other, still the wedding is taking place tomorrow morning. Hmm. Well... So, then what happens? They all get ready for the wedding. And she's there, isn't she? <coughs> the missus, the one with the long teeth coming down. She has to sweep away the teeth to eat anything, you know. <coughs> she is the bride, isn't she? You know, in Norwegian weddings, the bride always walks ahead. So they think about that. So they, they talk to the carpenters. Mm -hmm. Said, we got a little job for you. What is it? Well, I'm, adjustment, right? Yeah, I wonder, you know, we're going to walk here. We're going to go from this peak to that peak. Because that's the way it's done in this place. This is Norway, a lot of peaks. <laughs> and uh, we're going to walk across there. Could you make a little trap door, maybe? The carpenter said, I think we could do it. So the whole wedding party gets ready. And the one with the teeth and all of that stuff is finally going to get her man. <laughs> what happened? Well... Every magus, every warlock, every sorcerer in that part of the glass mountain had gathered. All the crows and all the ravens in the world had gathered and everyone was humming low. <laughs> everyone was humming low as this great, unseely, unholy procession made their way with the clashing knives and teeth of the Hag Queen at the first, preparing. And Robert, didn't she take one step out onto that delicate bridge? Yeah, she did. With her wonderful, ugly bride's costume, with the teeth poking out through, she took a step and down she went. So that's it. She went down. She went a thousand feet down. <coughs> now, are you happy about that? Yep. Yeah. Yes. But you got to realize she's going to come back up sooner than <laughs> that. <laughs> This is not a bush kind of world. <laughs> She's coming back up. But it'll be a while. And meanwhile, we can have some fun. Is that right? Yeah. So therefore, uh, they have the real wedding. Is that right? Tell us. They fix the bridge. And they have the real wedding. And the true bride steps forward. And Talamon princess have a fantastic wedding. One wedding is not enough for no. these two. Here's a detail that's worth knowing. For a day and a night, the wild third daughter was the queen of that glass mountain. And they say when she danced at the wedding, she had a small dagger hidden in her garter. And even a small, maybe a little pigeon skull or two hidden in her wedding dress. But one wedding is not enough. And they said, as we get towards the end of this taut story and the tale starts to wrap itself into the mouth of its beginning, we should have another wedding. We should go back to the beginning with the king, the queen, the other sisters. We should go back. And so they did. And they came down the sides of the glass mountain. And they went back to the cottages, didn't they? Along now, the way. Now, who was waiting in the cottages? Remember those three little houses with the children? Yeah. They picked up each of the children. And those were the girls. Those were her children. And you know what? Word of this wedding had got ahead. Word was traveling 50 miles ahead of them at any given point on the journey. And so excitement was happening. Birds were gathering. Great stories from other parts of the world were running as fast as they could from Africa and Australia and all other places to get to this wedding. It was Neruda there? Uh, yeah, he was there. Neruda came. Yeah. Uh -huh. Neruda came. Even Stephen Spender came. <laughs> Bob Dylan played. Yeah. <laughs> no one could understand the word that he saw. <laughs>
<laughs> I always say this, Johnny Cash ran the sweat lodge. <laughs> Tom Waits was doing the card games. <laughs> Who was telling the stories? I don't know, it was a blessed wedding. Uh, Joy was there. Yeah, I think so. I think Joy was telling the stories. Joy was the story there. In fact, I think she told the story of Lady Ragnell. And I think as she told it, a dark shadow appeared from just behind the wedding, from underneath that great chasm she'd fallen in and went, Ah, she's talking about my sister! And then disappeared into the fog. And so it was a great wedding. And the Irish like to say sometimes, all were in radiant contentment, all were in radiant contentment, all were in radiant contentment. Really? Yeah, briefly. Briefly. In radiant contentment. Now, but I believe... Did you have a bottle of wine? Is there a bottle of wine you picked up for that? That we got at the wedding. To bring did it you bring it back? We did. But there was a little problem because we were just taking it out of the car and it broke. Oh. And so I'm sorry we can't give you the wine <laughs> that we bought for you. Oh. We'll just have to exist on water the way we have been all the rest of our lives. So um, that's the end of this story, and we thank you for listening to it. <laughs>